All right. Well, hello, everybody. I think so. I'm going to leave you alone just a second. I just have to make sure. There you go. Okay. Hello. Uh, good morning, and welcome to my portfolio review. Uh, thank you for all coming so early in the morning. Uh, and during this time, I'd just like to talk about some of the most impactful projects I've done uh, as a creative tech major at Barry. And just before getting to the projects, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Helen. Uh, I'm an EVS and CRT double major. And I came to Barry as a declared EVS major. Uh, and although I was really passionate about what I was learning, I wasn't really too excited about the job outlook and the sort of careers that I could go in in the environmental science field. Uh, so I was looking for something more and I heard about the creative tech uh, department and I decided to take a tour with Zane Cochran uh, and it really piqued my interest and during that uh, tour he actually sat me down wrote out my entire schedule uh, and showed me how I could actually fit a double major in and still graduate in four years and immediately after that I went to the registrar and added the major uh, and just a little personal thing about me is that I love the outdoors um, it's something that's really integral to my person uh, and I am the student director of outdoor recreation here at Barry. Uh, and through that position, I get to really just facilitate, organize, and lead campus-wide adventures uh, for everyone to go on. I specifically mentioned that position because uh, I get to really just sort of be in nature, be with people, see that sort of relationship, and bring that relationship closer together. And that brings me into my portfolio theme which is improving environmental accessibility and knowledge through developing resources that promote awareness of the relationship between humans and environment. Uh, and so the projects that sort of fit this theme that I'll be talking about uh, really sort of address a specific audience and a specific issue with that audience. So the first project is trail signs that I made to go around campus. Uh, this was done originally for a hackathon, but afterwards I continued making these and installing them on the trail systems. Uh, and just to sort of quantify that, I made 36 of them. Uh, I made four for the hackathon, but then uh, in total 36. Uh, so the problem was that with that was that I sort of recognized that these trails weren't labeled whatsoever. Uh, and this really does sort of reduce the accessibility to people who want to use them. Uh, and that impact is being able to promote the accessibility and the use of these trails. Uh, and this is a map of the trail system at Barry. Uh, and just to as well quantify it, uh, the only trails that do not have signs are the snow loop and this uh, lazy horse trail. Uh, and there are plans for those to um, in the future be installed as well. And then the second project that I'd like to talk about uh, and this is sort of a two part project was the uh, my summer internship uh, for the Cahaba Riverkeeper. And the Cahaba Riverkeeper is an environmental nonprofit organization in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and their sort of mission is to be transparent with the public about any issues with the Cahaba River, uh, as well as sort of connect them to their mission and get people involved. Uh, and I was a GIS technician, and GIS is Geographic Information Systems. Uh, so what GIS technicians do is they, it's a sort of um, database management, data analysis. Uh, so I am analyzing spatial data and creating visualizations and maps from that analysis. So the first part of, uh, the first project that I did, or, sorry, uh, but the problem behind what the Riverkeeper hired me for was uh, being able to meaningfully convey issues to the public uh, through sort of these visualizations that I could make with GIS. Uh, and the first project that I did was uh, analyzing urbanization within the watershed. Uh, what I did with that was I found a data set of land cover from 1992 to 2019. Uh, and with that, I was able to really specifically look at the increase in urban development within the watershed. <clears throat> Uh, and furthermore, I was able to narrow that down to the specific subwatersheds. So this big outline is the entire watersheds and then the smaller polygons are the subwatersheds. And what I was able to do with this was really specifically see what areas of the river are being most impacted uh, by this urban development. And I was able to make visualizations like this uh, to sort of really quantify 
that change over time. Uh, and these are all the different salt watersheds. Uh, and the impact that this had is that the Riverkeeper actually went to several dis different uh, alliance meetings for river alliances. Uh, they actually came up here to Rome, uh, invited me to attend one of these meetings. I wasn't able to go, uh, but they presented these in front of these sort of their co-workers who are in the same field, uh, just to like sort of show the impact of this. Uh, and they're also able to take this and compare it to the data that they collect on water quality uh, for these specific areas. Uh, and then the second project that I did for them was looking at treated wastewater in the river. Uh, and this was sort of a pet project for them uh, because people sort of have this misconception that treated wastewater is like poopy water um, and they're sort of scared of it and they don't really understand it. You know, it's treated wastewater, there's nothing water, nothing wrong with it, like it's what you drink. Um, but they wanted to be able to sort of show this to people who may not completely understand it, uh, as well as just know for themselves when they're talking to people about this. Uh, so what I did is I took six wastewater treatments within the watershed and I actually went into uh, the Alabama Department of Environmental Management databases uh, and searched those for reported documents of these wastewater treatments discharge. Uh, and then I took that, made a bunch of calculations with uh, there's flow meter data. Uh, so sort of like the height of the river, the cubic feet that are flowing per second. Uh, and I was able to calculate the percentage of the river that is treated wastewater. Uh, and it was surprisingly low, except for when um, there were months where there was like very little rain. Uh, but they were able to take this uh, and now they have this like fun fact that they can actually go and share with people. Uh, and just sort of a tidbit about this project was that when I was looking through these databases, I found two uh, treatment plants that were misreporting uh, these uh, discharge rates. Uh, so the Riverkeeper actually went after them, uh, which I think is pretty significant. Uh, this is an organization that has like $1 million settlements uh, for environmental law disputes. Uh, and then just the impact of all of that was being able to connect the audience to the environmental resources and information. Uh, so that audience was the other river keepers within the southeast, as well as sort of people who aren't as well informed about the mission of the river keeper. <coughs> the third project that I'd like to talk about is my pottery particle study. And this was a group project for CRT 399. And the um, <clears throat> prompt for this project was to find an issue on campus and address it with sensor data. Uh, so the issue that we kind of found out was that students uh, within the ceramic studio were kind of concerned about the dust that they were breathing in. Um, and they didn't really know about, you know, how harmful that is. Uh, so we wanted to find that out and be able to report that to them. Uh, so just sort of the nature with working with clay, um, it dries out, breaks down into dust. And uh, in the studio, they actually do mix clay, which is just mixing a bunch of dust with water. Uh, so if you've ever been in the studio, everything really is just covered with dust. Uh, and we wanted to see sort of how uh, bad that is for your respiratory health. Uh, so we did that with a part particulate sensor. Uh, what that does is measure particles between 1 and 10 nanometers in size. Uh, once you get below 2.5 nanometers, uh, that starts being really bad for you because it's able to really deeply penetrate your lungs uh, and penetrate that blood barrier. Uh, and so we use this particulate sensor with the ESP32, which is a Wi-Fi enabled sensor. So we were able to sort of see that data in real time live. Uh, and the three research questions that sort of guided uh, our investigation of this problem was, are the particulates measured in the studio at a healthy level? How are these particulate concentrations affected by activities in the studio and should N95 masks be required? Uh, so we were able to make visualizations from the data that we collected through charts.js. Uh, and this was addressing the first question, uh, which was if the particulate levels were at a healthy level. Uh, and we compared these to EPA standards and we found that very, very, very rarely did they ever dip into a point where it would be concerning. So the screen part was the amount of time where it wasn't at a good level, that acceptable level. And then this yellow 
part was where it was like, maybe if you're severely asthmatic, you may want to be concerned. Uh, and then the, for the second question, the activities affecting it, we, since it was live data uh, and had timestamps, we were able to sort of divide it up to um, being in class and out of class. Uh, we found that this pink is in class. So when there's more people in the studio, there's more dust being stirred up. Uh, so that does sort of impact that environment. And the last one, this is personally my favorite, um, this visualization. Uh, so this is the over time, the particulates, um, and this was the if N95 mass should be required. Um, and the first question sort of addressed that, you know, the particulates are in that sort of healthy range. Uh, so it is nothing to worry about, but if you were concerned, if you were sort of in an at risk, risk group, um, you could look at this and see, you know, this is what you'd be exposed to on the green line if you weren't wearing a mask. And then this purple line, you know, you would be exposed to essentially nothing. Um, so that impact was being able to inform these students who had that concern uh, of this environment and the health and quality of that air. Uh, and then my final project I'd like to talk about is my capstone, uh, which is the River Prism project. Uh, this is very similar to uh, the particulate study, but it is um, a study of water quality in the river. Uh, and I also developed two sensors for that. Um, but the problem that I was trying to address was <clears throat> run the effects of runoff pollution and urbanization on water quality. And my goal behind it was to sort of bring light to the issue for people who may not be in my field um, and like sort of in the know about the issue. Uh, so what I did was I took uh, TDS and turbidity sensors and incorporated it into the sensor module. Uh, that was waterproof, but TDS and turbidity are considered sort of amongst the water quality parameters, the ones that are most indicative of urban runoff pollution. Uh, so TDS is total dissolved solids. Uh, so just any sort of minerals um, that are in the water, uh, that sensor will pick that up. And then turbidity is the amount of suspended particles, uh, so sort of the clarity of the water. Uh, and both of these uh, parameters, you know, if they're higher, uh, it is bad for the water. Um, and instead of like using a Wi-Fi enabled sensor, I use an LTE enabled sensor. So I was able to collect live data from the field. Uh, and I think this is very impactful because I was able to compare it to rainfall. Uh, and LTE is just sort of how your cell phone connects to the internet, same sort of idea with the sensor. Uh, with this project, uh, I mentioned that I had two different modules. I put one in a high impact and one in a low impact urban area. Uh, and I deduced these sites through GIS analysis again, uh, sort of similar to my project with the Riverkeeper. I use land covered data uh, to quantify sort of uh, the urban development within a certain uh, distance of the riverbank. So that those two areas are pointing to my two different sites that I use. Uh, and I took my data and presented it on a publicly accessible website. Uh, so in this website, I sort of talk about the issue, <clears throat> talk about my methods, how I found the sites, uh, and then presented my data. Uh, so this was the turbidity. Um, I thought the most interesting part of this project was being able to see this data compared to the rainfall. Uh, and how like, even though there was no rain for about three and a half days, the turbidity level did not drop off for a significant amount of time. <clears throat> and then I was able to sort of compare these high and low impact sites. Uh, so for turbidity, uh, the high impact urban site uh, had higher, higher average readings overall. Uh, but for the TDS, the lower impact area had higher readings. And I sort of attribute this to TDS sort of being more indicative of agricultural runoff uh, and everything upriver of my low impact site was just privately owned farmland. Uh, but this impact of the study was being able to inform the public of this issue through these visualizations and just the information that I have and I'm able to deliver to them. So future outlook, I have a job. I start May the 15th pretty soon. Uh, I'm very excited, but it is the position is a controlled engineer for the escape game. 
in Nashville, Tennessee. So what I'll be doing is creating escape games. Uh, so there's sort of a team that comes up with the concept uh, and the ideas and how all the parts fit together and sort of the themes of the game room. And then I will be actually making that come to life and be something that they can actually develop. Um, and this doesn't really have anything to do with environmental science, but I did mention at the beginning that I was not too excited about the careers in that field. Um, if I'm being honest, I, I, I declared a CRT major, dropped the EVS major, and then figured out that I could do it, so I like added it back. Uh, and that really just is because I could do it, and it's stuff that I'm interested in, not necessarily what I want to do professionally. So thank you.